distracted, if y'all want to be with my lesson, right? If y'all want to distract me enough and not just have me up here harping the whole time All for right, two distract, hours. Distract, hey, you distract. have to pick a date for that test, too. I'm going to. What? Jets. What? Jets. What? We. All right. <laughs> so we talked about shoulder, shoulder arthrograms last time. Now we're going to talk about knee arthrograms and detail them. Huh? huh? I did send these to y'all. They're, they're, they're in your email now. They're all divided up, though, per section. So it's like five or so PowerPoints. I didn't do that. So not really so email. Oh. They're very large. Okay, so when we do the arthrograms, we're going to focus on what's called the vertical ray method, which looks like this torture device up here with the gloved hand. That's our vertical ray method arthrogram, considered the ideal optimized way to get these exams done. And they're going to use what we call a stress device. What's a stress device? That's that torture machine you see right there that lengthens and straightens out the leg to further separate that joint space so we can fill up that joint space with contrast and get the best overall look at those menisci, those menisci and the synovial joint space. We're going to fill up with that contrast because why do we do arthrograms? To check the integrity of those joint spaces and those ever important joints of the knee, shoulder, wrist, and only those, right? <coughs> Only shoulder, joint. knee, and wrist. Mm -hmm. Correct. Any joint. Any joint is technically allowable for arthrograms. So we will put this lay on stress device after contrast administration. It's to widen that joint out. What kind of images will we do as plain films? We'll do just a plain AP knee. And we'll do an AP oblique. We're going to rotate that leg 20 degrees to the right and to the left. That's going to help coat that entire synovial joint capsule. And give us that nice, beautiful view of that knee joint. And along with that stress device, often the doctor will pull the leg, like you're seeing right here, just to further separate that joint space and give that best overall look of that synovial capsule found in the knee. So here's some anatomy we need to review. We looked at this a little bit in Rad Pro 2. Uh, if you remember way back a year ago, I said, don't worry about memorizing this now, but put it in the parking lot till later. Well, we're taking it out of the parking lot and we're gonna look at it now. So these are some of those very important ligaments and tissues found in the knee around that joint space that they're often going to evaluate using these arthrograms. Now along with arthrograms, usually with the knee, they're going to do MRIs to check these tissues, but depending on how much money or insurance that, that patient has, they may only rely on the arthrogram to evaluate that knee and any kind of tears going on. So if we're looking at this knee here, think of it on what side of the knee, by the way? Lateral, lateral side. So we have the lateral meniscus and the medial meniscus. We have the LCL the ACL, the PCL, and the MCL. Does anybody know what those stand for? ACL. Anterior cruciate ligament. Anterior cruciate ligament. So what do you think the other one stands for? Posterior cruciate ligament. Posterior cruciate. Lateral. lateral cruciate. And then medial. Medial cruciate. Know how to label those. That's some tissues that we're going to evaluate while we're doing those arthrograms. Over here we're looking at a side view, sagittal slice of the knee. There's your patella. There's your superimposed condyles of the femur. And here's that joint cavity that we're going to look at. If you've done these in clinic, you may notice that when they're filling up that joint capsule, it makes that J shape, just like this. So what's up? Huh? I said, yeah, what's up? What's up? Yeah, what's up? Like a J or whatever. Oh. J for J. Good Lord. Okay. <laughs> That's going to be that whole synovial joint space that we're evaluating that you see in purple here. That's the area of interest. But we also have what's called the articular cartilage. We also evaluate that. Why do you think we evaluate that articular cartilage? To see if it's gone. To see if it's, see if it's eroded. Bone, bone. Because if it is eroded, what's going to happen? Bone. Bones bone. are going to be grinding against bones, and that's going to be very, very painful. Then we have the medial meniscus here that's also adding to that padding area. We want to make sure that's still intact. And then, of course, we have that. That's just more the side of the joint cavity back here. It goes between the knees all the way up towards that upper portion of the femur as well. These bursas, don't really worry about those. Don't worry about your tendons like the quadriceps or these muscles. I want you to focus on the cruciate ligaments and your synovial joint capsules and your menisci. That's the main points of interest on those. Mm -hmm. Is the meniscus a ligament or is it a... They're padding. They're padding. More padding to and help... It can uh, can yes, they can. They can rupture as well. If you fall. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, are we seeing the falling of the patella implant in the first Yes. 
That's why it's easy to dislocate your patella. Yeah, if you hit your patella the right way, I mean, it can be knocked up here, it can be knocked over here, it can be knocked to the side. You never seen that before? Super uncomfortable. Well, actually, now mm -hmm. that you say that, I think I have. Yeah, it's um, it's held by, well, really, it's two ligaments. You have the ligament, you get the tendon up here, you have the bursal ligaments down here as well, holding it in place. But it's very easy to dislodge, to answer your question. Yes, very painful as well. You have a lot of freedom of motion. You can actually move it a lot. Um, yeah, you can just pop it out of the socket right now if you want to. Just yeah. You can. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so that's just showing you what those plane films would look like, guys. If we're looking at this very close, there's your femur, there's your tibia, here's the joint space we're evaluating, and that's what the meniscus would look like on an x-ray. Actually, very hard to see. This would not be what we consider an optimal way of looking at these areas because CT and MRI is just going to be superior in every way at evaluating the knee joint space and, of course, tendons and ligaments. All right, so for knee arthrography, we will use double contrast. Double contrast is going to, of course, be composed of the contrast and air in combination. It's the only way we can really see that joint space very well. So to demonstrate the medial meniscus, we're going to have, patient, have the patient lie semi-prone with the medial meniscus up. Reason being, we actually want the fluid of the meniscus and the joint capsule to fall down to give us a better overall visualization of the meniscus with just air, essentially, just air. So we're going to put that up in the air. The area of interest will be up in the air. We'll widen the joint space with manual stress and using that device you saw on that first slide. CR will be centered to the medial side of the knee on the meniscus for the first exposure, and then we'll make five subsequent exposures, rotating the limb towards the pine 30 degrees for each exposure. Basically, they're just going to check that joint and that meniscus at different angles as you move that leg back and forth. Also, it's going to coat that joint space as well with more contrast giving you that overall better series of pictures. They don't really ever do these much anymore, by the way. Um, if you do do these in clinic, really all they're gonna do is just inject that contrast. The doctor's just gonna take pictures with the floor machine. You're not gonna do these plain films like we're learning about right here. Very, very rare. Have they made y'all do plain films on arthrograms? I doubt it, right? I didn't think so. All right, to demonstrate the lateral meniscus, well, once again, area of interest will be elevated. We'll put the patient semi-prone, lateral meniscus facing up. We'll also widen that joint space and essentially do the exact same thing for that lateral meniscus. Six exposures for lateral, by the way, five for medial, six for lateral. Reason being, the lateral is slightly larger than the medial. So first exposure will be the initial prone oblique, and then we'll rotate that limb 30 degrees towards the supine position for each exposure, just getting different visualizations of that joint space and that meniscus isolated. So done the exact same way, we're just adding one extra exposure for our lateral meniscus. That's kind of what it looks like right there. So they're in a prone position, and then they're going to semi-supine? Yes. Yes. Um, so, wait, where do I have semi supine? Semi prone? I mean, but like yeah, rotating the limb right there in the 30 degrees. degrees. Second pelvic on the top. Semi prone? And then you have so, yeah, you're going to rotate it not all the way supine, but towards supine. Mm -hmm. so you're just twisting the leg. Also, you can't twist the leg all the way supine, but you're twisting it towards the supine position. What's that saying? They will stay prone the whole time. We're just twisting the leg to make it more supine. And as you twist it, it actually opens that joint up more and more. And how do you do six exposures on one time? I actually am not sure about that. I was reading that in the notes today when I was studying this, and that is a really good question. I am not sure, but that's what the, that's what the Merrill's book says. I don't. I thought that'd be a mess because you wouldn't really be able to see anything. It's on one IR, but. I must find out more about that. I'm curious too. I don't know if that's a typo, but the book has it too. The book, it's in the book. I'm not sure about that. But that's what the curriculum says. All right, so now we're just gonna go to hip arthrograms to wrap up arthrography. So why do we do hip arthrograms? To evaluate congenital hip displacement in children. That's a big reason we do those. Protecting a loose hip prosthesis in adults has actually come out of socket quite easily, a lot more than you realize. And to confirm infection of the joint space in the hip. That hip joint space is actually very prone to infections. Which is why it freezes up on a lot of elderly patients. 
Pelvic puncture site will be in the inguinal crease, lateral to the palpated femoral pulse. We're going to fill up that area where the acetabulum is located. And usually they'll use a spinal needle to, re to reach that specific joint capsule, a little bit of a deeper injection spot compared to the knee and the shoulder. So as far as um, anatomy goes in this section, guys, obviously what I want you to really focus on is you're going to see those synovial joint capsules very well with the contrast, but all that anatomy we learned from Rev Pro 2 on your shoulder, your knee, and your hip, it's all going to come back into play as well. Does that make sense? All that area that we've talked about, the trochanters, the tuberosities, the joint spaces, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So make sure you're tightening up on your anatomy with those. Okay. Yeah. Is that a pediatric patient? Which one? Both of them. They are, yes. How do you know that? Because of they left you to that way? Correct. You see the the um, obturator foramen is not fused. The rami are not together. They do that on pediatrics? That's a young kid. Yeah, they do this a lot on pediatrics because they have a lot of congenital hip displacement diseases. Yes. Very common pediatric exam. I have a question too. Like, um, these uh, type of exams, do they check for abuse on kids too? Or they can't really see? This one, not in particular. Usually they'll check that prior. Okay. Um, really what they check is like an actual deformity of okay. kids. Yes, because adults get a lot of infections in the hip, hip joint, especially as they get older. Why? I don't know why, I just know it's very common. All right, and of course, other joints. Once again, any of the other joints can be evaluated by arthrograms. We're not going to focus on those too much. The main ones I want you to focus on being the shoulder, knee, and the hip. But keep in mind, any joint can be evaluated under fluoroscopy using those arthrography injections. This, of course, would be what? It's a wrist. Good Lord, only one person knows it's a wrist. It's a wrist. Okay, it's a wrist. I hope you all know it's a wrist. Yes, okay. So brush up on your purple bones. Hint, hint. You may or may not see that on your test. I'm just saying. I got this. I just got a feeling. Still remember. There you go. It's going to be an image like this for a contrast. It would be a contrast image, yes. It's so hard to see. Look at you. But if you look closer, you can still make out the little borders pretty easily. I think that's y'all has some practice as well. Okay, which forms of contrast? may be used for arthrograms. Combination. It's going to be a combination of both, radiopaque and radiolucent. What would be the radiopaque contrast? Not barium, but the iodine-based contrast. Please don't inject barium. <laughs> that would be, that's going to be a bad time. We're going to try to push that syringe. We're like, I won't go in. And what would be radiopaque contrast? I'm sorry, radiolucent, radiolucent. Air. Air. Air, correct. So a combination of both, that would equal a double contrast study. That should be C, I'm sorry. That means the same thing all the above. So combination of radiopaque and radiolucent. Okay, which joint is most commonly imaged via arthrograms? What's the most common one we do? The shoulder. The shoulder, correct, correct. Most common area that we have those tears with those ligaments. Second most popular would be your, um, be your knee, followed by the hip being the third most common. Okay, so now we're gonna go to liver and biliary. See, arthrograms, it wasn't too bad, not too much new info. Liver and biliary mostly should be reviewed because we talked about that way back on the first semester, not first semester, first PowerPoint of this semester, where we labeled that biliary tree. So guess what, I still want you to be able to label the biliary tree and the gallbladder. So if we're having some issues with that, we're gonna briefly review that going forward. And we're gonna talk about the actual procedures that we do when it comes to biliary tract. These are actually interesting to watch. I like watching these in clinic, especially that last one, ERCP. We used to do a bunch of those at TCH, and it's very fascinating to watch. We're gonna talk about a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography, post-operative T-tube cholangiogram, which is probably the second most common one that they do and the endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography. Oh, no. That's a, much easier to say ERCP. You just ain't gonna get it. 
<laughs> so make sure on your chest you write out endoscopic, <laughs> retrograde, phalangeo, <laughs> pancreatic, or feet. The whole word. Right there. The whole word. That's, that's, that's a test question right there. Yes. What was the answer? Don't start. Hmm? Shoulder. I'm going to go to clinic and so ask what the test with them. What the, you what should. See if they remember what it is. The, uh, what we're looking at here is actually a T2. Does anybody know how I know this is a T2? Aside from it's labeled as a T2? How do I know this is a T2 exam? Because it's a it actually makes the shape of a T right yeah. here. Oh, you okay. oh. It's actually the shape of a T. It's a T2 cholangiogram. But everything else should look pretty familiar. There's that common hepatic duct. There's the right. There's the left. What was around right here, guys? The common bile duct. We have the gallbladder is not showing up on this image. The gallbladder is about right here. What does the gallbladder connect with? How does the gallbladder connect to the bile duct via the cystic duct? And there you go, in case you forgot, guys. There's that very important hepatic tree. Bless you. Thank you. Just remember, start from the gallbladder. We have the fundus of the gallbladder down here. We have the cystic duct, which connects to the common bile duct. If you move more superior, you have the common hepatic duct. Then your right and left hepatic ducts that branch into that actual tree that we see on those exams. Which one of the hepatic? The hepatic ducts right here. Okay. Those are common hepatics right here. It just says hepatic is common. Okay. Here's the right and the left branching off. Of course, your pancreatic duct here that all jumps into the duodenum. Does anybody remember what that, <laughs> anybody remember what that funny word was there that jumps into the? Yeah, that ampulla of Vader. Ampulla of Vader. Very good. Correct. Ampulla of Darth Vader. That's right. Okay, so percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram. We're just so long. Percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram, abbreviated PTC, thank God. Why do we do this? It's primarily for patients with jaundice. And what is um, what is jaundice exactly? Y'all should know what that is. It's an issue with the liver whenever you get very yellow. Have y'all seen any jaundice patients out there? They actually do look yellow. So when a patient has jaundice and we know the ductal system is being affected, we will have that demonstrated by CT or SONO, but often that's unclear. So they're going to go ahead and do this exam to further examine that area to see what's going on and see how that area of the body is malfunctioning, so to speak. So they'll also usually put a drainage catheter to treat what they call obstructive jaundice. Some of that infection you can actually drain out via that catheter. And that's what it looks like right there. There's the tiny little catheter going directly into that hepatic tree. That's the right hepatic duct. That's the left hepatic duct joined together to the common hepatic duct you see right here. Looks a mess, but that's in general what we're looking at. As we go down, there'll be your common bile duct. Cystic duct about right here. Gallbladder is a little bit difficult to visualize. But that'd be what your PTC exam looks like. They don't do these much anymore. They mostly are going to do the T tubes or the ERCPs. But um, if they were doing this, patient would be supine. Right side, surgically prepared and draped. Why is it the right side? What side's your liver and gallbladder on? The right side. Right side. Just make sure you know what side it's on. They will use a local anesthetic. They will not put you completely under for these. You're usually just sedated. They'll use a special skinny needle called a chiba. Chiba needle. That's the chiba needle. Itty bitty. And they'll use a water soluble iodinated contrast under fluoro. After they fill up that ductal system, like you see right here, they're just going to do spot AP projections. Like I said, they don't do these much anymore. This is pretty obsolete. The next two, they do still readily perform a lot, especially on pediatrics. Uh, are those staples? Those are staples, surgical staples. They've been opened up before, luckily to try to repair the biliary system. All right, got cut up down here too. Now we're gonna talk about the post-operative T2. By the, word, by the way, what does post-operative mean? After, After surgery, surgery. so post-operative T2 cholangiogram, also called delayed cholangiography and T2 cholangiography. Goes by all the names. We'll use an actual T-shaped tube, like I showed you on that first picture. It'll be placed in the common hepatic and the common bile duct, respectively, for post-operative drainage. So after they've done a surgery, like on the gallbladder or hepatic tree, 
It's very common for drainage to build up in that area. So they'll do these T2 cholangiograms to drain the extra fluid out to help prevent further infection in that specific Wait. area of the body. So they do another surgery after surgery? Or they, just put they, the do a, they do a procedure after surgery. And That's why it's post-operative. So they insert the tooth, correct? They do. So it's not really, well, it is. It's good. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, it is. It can be done in a floral room, by the way. They can do these in a floral room. Because I've had teeth surgery. I didn't know when they did that. You have this exam? And it was, you you have this so exam? This one, but I'm just saying I've had two being put in for drainage, right, after surgery. But I didn't know if that was done, like, right after. Is this something that's done exactly after the surgery? Or, like, pretty, they, I mean, like not you have the surgery? And not immediately, like but pretty pretty shortly after. I mean, okay. that, that, drain, that, um, that fluid will build up really quickly and yeah. get infected. So they, they move pretty fast on those. So perform the demonstrate caliber and patency of the ducts. Status of that sphincter of the hepatopancreatic ampulla in the presence of any more residual or undetected stones in that gallbladder. And what are gallstones called? Cololiths. What are kidney stones called? Renal calculi. So make sure you don't know the difference. Everyone always mixes those up. Cololiths. And look, it's in the word. Cola. Not, not Coca-Cola. C-H-O-L. C-H-O-L refers to gallbladder biliary system. If Coca-Cola helps you, go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it will be formed in the radiology department, just under normal fluoro. Preliminary prep will be the tube will be clamped the day before the procedure. The tube will be filled with bile to prevent air bubbles. Proceeding meal withheld. Cleansing enema one hour before procedure if needed to clear up that area, and a preliminary KUB will be obtained. That T2 cholangiogram. It looks just like this. Same picture we looked at before. There's your T2 that's been inserted surgically. It's already going to be in there. They're actually just going to inject the contrast in the floor room through that already inserted T2 with that patient under light sedation. Yes. Is there anything that like stays out? You know, like a, the tube. Like, yeah, just a tube. Does it have like a bag? It does for drainage. Yes, it does. It's like that nasty old bile. The bile's pretty gross. So they put the tube in to inject contrast to look at the building. And for drainage. And for drainage. Dual purpose. Um, and then they took out the tube? If, well, once, they, once they're able to, like if they're still having a buildup of fluid and issues, they're going to keep it in until they can confirm there's no more fluid buildup. So they're gonna monitor that patient for a few days to see if it reaccumulates. If it doesn't, they can remove that too. So stuff comes out and stuff goes in. Same yes. It well, all you're gonna put in there is contrast. Mm -hmm. um, everything else needs to come out. And really they'll pump the contrast back out as well. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a great question, just for fun thoughts sus. here. It's a little sus. Okay, Ariel. Stuff coming in and out, isn't that little well, contrast is not with contrast, not really. Now, here's here's a great fun question. Look at the shape of this thing. It is a T shape. I don't think they get that in there. It goes in like an arrow, like this, and then out. You're actually absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you can demonstrate that again, Jay, it's, they put it's it like in an arrow, so straight, in, and then they and extend it once it's in the actual bile duct. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, like, I right, so they probably do different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how they do it. And of course, uh, when they're ready to take it out, they just retract it and it folds back up. It folds back up when they're pulling it out. Hopefully, they don't pull it out like that. They'll just rip the whole tree out, which would be very painful. But pretty cool stuff to watch. These examples, like I said, are very interesting to watch at the hospital. I always liked being in on these. Okay, so after the KUB has been obtained, the patient will be put in an RPO. Why would we put them in an RPO? with the right upper quadrant centered. Why not an LPO? Well, because you want to see the left side. It's going to where it is the biliary tree and the gallbladder. Right side is a little more posterior. I want to put it closer to the IR to separate it from anything else it's going to superimpose on as well. Get that nice, beautiful look at it. Contrast media will be injected into the T tube under fluoro, and it'll make those spot films as needed with the fluoro tower. You're usually not gonna do plain films aside from that one KUB. 
These were always done by Dr. Fishhead. I call him Dr. Fishhead. He was uh, very good at what he does, but a very arrogant man. So either call him Fishhead or Fishface. Fishhead. He's like very in love with himself, but very talented at the same time. Quite a dichotomy. He did a lot of these on kids. The ones he did the most are actually this next one that we call the ERCP. Which those are really cool to watch. Here we go, ERCP, very cool exam. If you've never seen one of these, they often do them at pediatric facilities. What's really neat about these is you're doing a combination of the fluoro with the endoscope. And if you ever saw an endoscope procedure, that's a camera that goes inside the patient. You can actually see inside of the gallbladder, the biliary tract, and so on. It's very, very cool to watch. So why do we do these to diagnose biliary and, and key word here, that's why it's in the name, pancreatic pathologic conditions. So, useful method when the ducts are not dilated and the ampulla is not obstructed. We'll use a fiber optic endoscope through the mouth, by the way, into the duodenum under fluoroscopy. Now, think about that. Why do we put a fiber optic scope through the mouth and then into the duodenum? Because aren't we trying to get to the gallbladder and the biliary tree? It's not a trick question, so I'll make sure you know your anatomy. There's you can exit or enter the gallbladder through the ampulla vader, right? Well, not the gallbladder, but you can get to the biliary tract through the ampulla vader. So think about it. Is there any other way to access that biliary tree aside from the duodenum? No. We have to go through the mouth and essentially go backwards. So we're going to go down the throat, through the stomach, into the duodenum. Duodenum is where all that bile dumps through the ampulla vader, so they will enter the ampulla and then trace it up the tree towards the gallbladder. So it's like a, almost like they're going through a maze to try to find it. That's why it's really cool to watch them do these, because you get to watch this camera the whole time, go down the throat, into the stomach, through the duodenum. They find that little tiny ampulla. It's a very, very itty bitty little opening. They get through there and then trace it up till they see that cystic duct and go directly into the gallbladder. Pretty fascinating okay. stuff. They are only sedated. They're not asleep. And that's probably the only, the only part that's a little hard because they're kind of gagging the whole time. Or, uh, the whole time. But they don't, they don't know what's going on because they're giving them the forget drug. So I always think these look like as well. Wait until the difference between these two exams. T2, easy to see. It looks like a T. ERCP looks like they have a snake inside of them. That's the camera. That's the camera that they're using to get into the biliary tract. That's what it looks like right there with that illustration. Doctor's going to be looking down this thing. You're going to have it up on a TV screen as well. You're going to trace that all the way down into the stomach, to the duodenum, into that ampulla of Vader, and then trace it towards the gallbladder. So if I actually put a local anesthetic in the throat to um, hopefully not hurt the throat too bad because they are awake, just heavily sedated during this exam. We can't put them to sleep on it. I don't know why that is, but it is heavily sedated. But they don't remember what's going on. They give them the forget-me-not drug. It's a real drug, by the way, the forget drug. I just forget the name of it. Fentanyl. That's it, thank you. It can make you forget everything that you experience. Wait, you, you said you forget the name of it? Uh, yeah. Are you okay? They, they must get the drug initially, yeah. So the hepato pancreatic ampulla will be cannulated, and that's usually what your images will look like right there. See how it looks like a snake? So this endoscope has gone through the throat into the stomach, we're in the duodenum about this point, and he'll, he'll stop right here before the duodenum starts going down, and he'll get a smaller camera that will find that ampulla, and it'll look like a little tiny wire that will trace all the way up here, and usually that camera will go inside that cystic duct right here, and they'll be able to look inside the gallbladder. It's like amazing go, how small they are. It's, it's, it's tiny, yeah, it's super like tiny, tiny, but it's like, like a super yeah. HD camera, like super really clear resolution. It's really neat to watch. Those I'm sure they reuse because that's like probably hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars for each of those. So um, contrast will be injected. Um, they'll usually take fluoro images alongside having that camera looking inside internally. Um, spot and conventional images, but like I said, usually that's just all going to be taken by the doctor using that fluoro safe feature. Usually they get that, they call that the gold star shot right there where you have the snake in the tree. I call it the snake in the tree. Your endoscope and your whole biliary tree filled up with that contrast. So usually you'll actually do these with a um, C-arm. 
typically. Uh, at least where I work, they had specialized rooms for these. And we'd bring the C-arm in there while he had his endoscope going and kind of go in and out as he needed us to take those fluoro images. So are you saying that there's another tube attached to that tip? So yeah, that's what's really crazy. So you have the main camera right here. Once you get to this point, you stop and they have another camera that they feed in here with a wire because this is a very small area. This would, of course, bust through it. So they have to trace that little wire into the ampulla and that little camera is going to go all the way up in here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And usually what you're seeing is this most of the time. That's actually the ampulla of beta right there. See, there's the smaller camera that he's put into the ampulla once he opened it up. He's tricked. So this was the, this is the very end of this endoscope right here. He's going to trace this tiny wire into that ampulla. This is another tube that's going down with the camera to hold that open. To hold that ampulla open so he can feed it into it right there. Right, so it's really cool stuff. I always get excited talking about those. They're always really neat to watch. Okay, and here's just a couple more practice images, guys, of ERCPs. Here's your camera once again in the duodenum. Here is the biliary tract. Here's the common bile duct. Here's your cystic duct. There's your gallbladder hanging off. Still going up, there's your common hepatic. And then your right and your left hepatic branching off on each side. Same thing over here. There's your endoscope stopping in the duodenum. Actually, your camera goes up, up the common bile duct, cystic duct, gallbladder, common hepatic, and then it branches to the right and the left at the very top. And you also see that main pancreatic duct as well going horizontally. Main ones I want you to focus on though, of course, is that main biliary tree with the gallbladder coming up to the right side over here. Excuse me. So keep in mind, guys, once again, when it comes to biliary trees, they're not always going to look exactly the same or as pretty. Every patient, they look very unique, kind of like every tree is unique. The branches all look differently. Same thing with the hepatic trees. <laughs> I'm left with this front row nodding off over here. <laughs> y'all are like literally doing the, like the nod off, <laughs> both of y'all over there. You okay? Well, let's talk about reproductive system. That'll wake you up. All right. Let's take a break time first. I know. Let's take a quick break. Wake up. This is very, it's actually very important stuff.